And I'm Bill Curtis for Channel 2 News. Good morning. New signs today that cleaning up the flooding in the loop could take a lot longer than the city had hoped. And serious problems in the CTA subways could keep them closed for a long time. You're looking at a live picture now of the worksite near Kinsey Bridge over the river. Engineers are just preparing to pour quick drying concrete down a hole and seal off one end of the flooded freight tunnel 56 feet below. The latest till now, new estimates that it will take 10 to 15 days to plug the leak and drain the water from beneath the loop so the cleanup can begin. CTA subways in the loop could be closed for two weeks, maybe more. Experts now estimate that the cost of the flood will exceed $1 billion. Channel 2's Jay Levine is at Kenzie in the River. Where else would we expect to find him to tell us the latest on the efforts to patch the stubborn leak? Jay? Thank you, Bill. Good morning. It seems like we've been here forever, doesn't it? The fact is that there is progress being made here today. Throughout the night, divers were working down in the hole using those vacuum cleaners, that electric vacuum cleaner, to get out the debris, the soil, the silt, the rock, others from the bottom, so that they could have a clean seal for the concrete that they're about to pour down. Two divers were working down in the hole overnight. They were working down there for about five hours. One down there for two hours, the other down there for three hours. They appear to be up now and they are preparing. We were told that 11 o'clock was the target time for them to actually start pouring the concrete in. The divers cleaned it to such an extent that we were told that one was even scrubbing the walls of the tunnel with a broom. Uh, they've also installed an I-beam down there to use as a kind of a rebar to reinforce the cement that's going to be poured down. Mayor Daly was on the scene just about a half hour ago. He may still be down there, and uh, as is the case when something new takes place, like when the divers went down earlier this week, the mayor was down uh, there watching as it began. We got our first pictures of exactly what it looked like down in the tunnel late last night from a head cam, the helmet cam, we can call it. The pictures are not very good. Actually, we can see. We can see diver Shane Albertson's camera going down into the hole. There he enters the water for the first time, and we can see first the walls of the caisson, and now we actually see the tunnel itself. That is the tunnel. They're checking to see that the concrete walls are still stable. There's the ceiling of the tunnel, the roof of the tunnel, and what he reported was that the roof of that tunnel, the concrete there, was indeed stable, didn't seem like there were any cracks in it. Now, the diver was in constant communication with those above who were watching the pictures and telling him exactly what to do. Let's listen. Okay, pick up a uh, handful of mud and uh, hold your hands back up there and we'll see uh, how much flow there is. Roger that. Okay, this is kind of sand. Pretty amazing pictures, weren't they? The breakup in those pictures was every time he would move his head and turn it around, something in the cable would uh, lead to the breakup in those pictures. But they were pretty amazing pictures, and we found out a lot about what was going on down there from actually looking at it. Now, we can also tell you, give you a better idea of what's going to happen from here on. It's going to take most of the day to pour the concrete because they're going to be doing layer upon layer. And to give you a better idea of exactly how they're going to do it, I've got a sketch pad here where, despite the fact that I'm not a very good artist, I'm going to try and show you exactly how they're going to do this. What they're going to do is the diver is going to go down and they're going to position the concrete pipe and they're going to position it with a funnel on the end of it down on the bottom, like the very bottom of the shaft. They're going to pour the concrete right on the bottom and build up about a six inch base of concrete. The reason they don't drop it is that the concrete, when mixing with the water, will give you too much water. Everybody knows that concrete, of course, is a mixture of sand and gravel and cement, but they can't, and the water, but you can't have too much water because if you do, then uh, the concrete will disintegrate. It won't set properly. So what they do is they, they build up a base there, and then they actually pour the 
concrete into the base. And so then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it comes up into the hole. And then you should have at a 45 degree angle, the concrete spilling down here and forming almost a perfect seal, about seven feet at the top and about 12 feet at the bottom. Now, that should stop completely the flow of water from the breach tunnel under the river once and for all. They're hoping that'll be done by sometime this afternoon. If it works, if it does work, then they'll try the same thing on the other side. Let's get down and take one more look at exactly what's going on down below. It's a very graphic picture, what we can see. Uh, they're gathered around the tunnel right now. We go in very, very close, and we can actually see them now positioning the chute of the cement mixer. There you go, there's a good picture of what's going on. They're actually positioning the chute to pour the concrete into the tunnel. So, they set an 11 o'clock start. Bill, it's pretty close to uh, exactly what they uh, what they said they would they would be doing. That's exactly what's going on here, and that is the very latest because you're actually seeing it happen. It'll be, uh, it's very close. Uh, it'll be good to see the cement actually going down that chute. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Bill. As the investigation of the disaster widens, more people are expected to get the ax. At least a dozen more city officials may be fired after Mayor Daly finds out exactly who knew what when. Earlier this week, Daly forced Acting Transportation Commissioner John LaPlante to resign because he neglected a warning that the tunnel would collapse unless repaired. The Art Institute is recovering from the flood. Just about half an hour ago, it opened its doors for the first time since the flood hit on Monday. Officials there say they were worried that humidity, not flooding, might ruin the works of art. But their worries were unfounded. The humidity inside has remained stable, mostly, they think, because of the mild weather outside. But many buildings are still closed, including the City Hall, County Building, DePaul University, which has rented classroom space at 318 West Adams. Carson Perry Scott in the Loop also is still closed, as is Marshall Fields. Here is why Marshall Fields on State Street is closed. As you can see, flood water is still coming into the basement through that grill on the wall. The flooding has shut down the machinery and power in the grand old store, but not their sense of humor. This ad is running in the newspapers today. Marshall Field saying it's tough enough to stay afloat, but this is ridiculous. That picture is not unlike the scene we just saw in the store's basement. A waterlogged transformer near Marshall Fields caused darkness for several giant loop office buildings last night. ComEd deliberately shut off power in order to remove the equipment, but power is now restored. The buildings that now have electricity are one, Illinois Center, Cultural Center, United of America Building, North American Insurance Building, and the Prudential Building. Just how likely is it that the flooded tunnels will collapse? While the question has come up, officials with the city and Commonwealth Edison say the chances are almost nil. If the tunnels crack up, they'll probably take with them the ComEd power cables that provide electricity for more than 200,000 loop office workers. But the tunnels have concrete walls one feet, one foot thick, and they sit in firm subsoil with lots of protection. ComEd says if the tunnels do collapse, they can reroute their lines without too much of a problem. Our coverage of the flooding in the loop will continue. Next, the new price tag on the cost of the damage. And CTA tunnels are springing leaks, and that means it's going to take longer than expected to get things back to normal on the rails. We'll find out just how long. And people are banning hotlines this morning, trying to help victims of the flood, where you can get assistance next. An allergy. They released this video that shows water spraying into the subway, obviously under a lot of pressure. The tape shows dozens of leaks and an electrical switchboard drenched in running water. Passengers are being forced to exit the Dearborn subway at Milwaukee and Division. There, they board special shuttle buses to take them downtown. One bus driver plans to keep passengers happy. I want to send in, 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 in English, you know. Everything is beautiful, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that ha helps. Uh, not all the CTA passengers feel like singing, however. As we mentioned, it's going to be a long time to get travel back to normal. Channel 2's John Duncanson is now live at the Disaster Command Center with more on the CTA operations. John? Bill, that videotape you saw measured about 1,000 feet on the Dearborn-Milwaukee line. The tape shows water pouring in at a rate of about three to 400 gallons a minute, as well as uh, workers on scaffolding trying to pour gravel.
crowd into those leaks. We talked to CTA Chairman Robert Belcaster last night, and he told us that engineers are monitoring for structural weakness, but that CTA expects the tunnels to hold up well. Uh, both the State Street and Dearborn lines are closed. In the meantime, the CTA is diverting some lines to the L and using shuttle uh, bus service. Uh, Belcaster told us that it will, as you said, be at least two weeks, but two weeks after they can repair this. So it could be, in fact, uh, considerably longer than that before operations can resume. Cost uh, at this point, they're estimating a total of $20 million, but that doesn't figure in about $600,000 a day and the, the added uh, uh, repair cost that they're encountering. Uh, Chairman Belcaster told us that he is going to try and seek federal uh, disaster relief funds, but there's no indication as to whether he will get those at this point. We are live at the Dis Disaster Command Center. I'm John Duncanson, Channel 2 News. Bill. Let's get the latest now, John, on power problems around the loop. Tom Maiman, Commonwealth Edison, is here, as he has been the most of these mornings. How many are out, and where do we stand? There are still 17 <coughs> buildings, uh, Bill, that, that have uh, flooded basements and are unable to accept service. Uh, I really can't give you an estimate uh, when they'll be able to accept service, but we're prepared to work with them as closely as possible. In fact, we are organizing uh, teams of our specialists to visit each one of the building owners to see if there's something that we can do to assist. Uh, but that's that's really uh, too early to tell okay. you. We now hear an estimate of 10 to 15 days for, does that include the cleanup and will it include draining it through the deep tunnel, do you know? Bill, I, I really don't know. Uh, I've, I've said that in my best judgment, uh, after the water is drained from the tunnel and the basements, I would expect it'll take three days to clean up individual buildings, switch gear, before it's ready for service. So whatever that time frame is to drain the tunnel, add three days. Okay. Of the 17 buildings, City Hall, State of Illinois Office Building, and is there anything to be done, like the Board of Trade, to get them up and running? Well, there, there's always something that can be done, but we're really depending upon the, the buildings themselves to make that call as, as to what they feel they can do. The, the State of Illinois building, of course, is a, is a new building. It's high. The only reason it's flooded is because of that connecting tunnel. Uh, don't know what they're going to do in that regard. Uh, as we speak, the, uh, the Board of Trade, for example, is uh, livening the rest of their floors. Uh, they should be back in full service on Monday. Uh, as you know, we're, we're still dealing with two remaining vaults that have transformers underwater. Nothing wrong with the transformer, but in fact, because that water is lasting longer than a few days, the risk level is getting higher, and so we're going to be having planned outages over the next two days. So the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Thanks, Tom Maiman. Yes, Good sir. to see you again this morning. The cost of the Chicago flood could exceed or reach $1 billion, according to an expert at the Chicago Chamber of Commerce. Chief Economist John Scorberg says the cost in overtime, lost wages, and productivity alone will total $500 million, and the cleanup will cost at least that much. That does not include the estimated $20 million it will cost to fix the damage to the subway tunnels. If you're a victim of the flood, there's now a place for you to get some help. A disaster assistance office is open at the Klosinski building at 230 South Dearborn. It's for anyone who wants to apply for disaster aid from the federal government. Information about small business loans is also available. The office is open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily, even on weekends. Let's go back to Kinsey and the Chicago River for an update on work to stop the leak. Let's see if the cement is flowing yet. Jay? Bill, there's one report, uh, you're talking about dollar figures, that the uh, cost here is about $100,000 an hour. That's one published report, which would bring it in excess of a million dollars a day just here on this side alone. What we can see now, we saw one cement mixer that was uh, attached to the other side pulling away. The other one now pulled up. You can see the chute uh, pointed toward the hole. No cement going down there now. We just saw Mayor Daly. He was at the location where they were going to be pouring the concrete, and uh, he has just walked across the bridge to take a look at the other side to see what's going on down there. So it appears anyway that things are right on schedule, at least uh, this morning's schedule. We were told last Last night that they thought that they would have this sealed off uh, by early this morning. Obviously, they're a little late on that, and now the estimates are that it'll take most of the day to uh, get this cement pull all filled in and the plug firmly set. At that point, they'll go to the other side. 
they hope to have divers down there sometime later today. Bill, that's it from here. Thanks, Jay. Channel 2's coverage of the Loop flood will continue throughout the day and on the Channel 2 News at 4.30 and 6. And tonight at 7, we'll present a special report called The Great Chicago Flood. We'll report on why the flood didn't have to happen. It's a behind-the-scenes story of how a series of avoidable mistakes led to the flood. We'll take a close look at what happens to the flood water when the leak is plugged. And we'll report on the city's crumbling infrastructure. Could this kind of thing happen again somewhere else? Join us for the Great Chicago Flood tonight at 7 o'clock. We'll also see you again when news happens and at 4.30 and 6. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Curtis. We now join Family Feud in progress. Left the loop area. No other city has ever done that. A million people left. There's no one injured and no one killed. Sometimes you wish people were injured or killed. That makes your business much happier. You know, you... you... But there's no one injured or killed. Remember that. And I like to tell you that. Because you don't give credit for people doing their job. And a lot of people did their job that day. And I just want to say that and I'm proud of it. Not one person was injured or killed. And that's something that I can be proud of, and every person here in this room, and every person that worked on the problem can be proud of. Have you asked for anyone else's residence? Pardon me? Not yet. We don't have anything here. Have you asked for anybody else's residence? No, not yet. No. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Do you, have, thank you. Do you have a timeline on when you have that? The yeah, other participants no. will be available for, if you have further questions. Mr. Kenny, were you saying that uh, you, you can't start doing work on the west until the, uh, the, sun, the concrete on the east? Why, how would the west affect the east? I mean, just the vibrations of the work? Yeah, well, the, with the, uh, the, the way we are going to do the work with dropping the sandbags and the stone in will create a wave heading east and that wave will have a tendency to wash the cement out of the uh, concrete. Well, the first thing you do over there is send a diver down to measure the flow by the we, we have already measured the flow. On the other side? Both, we've been monitoring the flow continually. What is the flow on the other side? Uh, it's less than a knot in both areas. Does that mean that that probably is blocked off and will not go around the flood uh, the downtown area? I, I can't say that for sure. Is it almost, is it like three feet or three tenths of a foot <laughs> per... Uh, Per second? Yeah, per second. Somewhere in that area. So it is identical to over on this side. Flow. The flow when we first got there was greater than that, and we've slowed the flow down quite a bit by the work we've done in the river, obviously. Um, and now I think with the pumping going on, that's where we're creating a lot of flow as well. John, are you still on target uh, time-wise from what uh, you had talked about yesterday in terms of once the, the east portion of the tunnel is sealed off, you'll be able to, to, to uh, finish sealing off the whole tunnel? Correct. Does, does the sealing off of the east portion of the east bank, does, does that still uh, appear to prevent any further water from flowing into the tunnel system under the loop? Well, I can't say that because of the back feed that you might get through the west side because the tunnels are all interconnected throughout the all whole right, system. All right, Mayor Daly has uh, departed this briefing, uh, leaving uh, it in the hands now of uh, the technical people. They're uh, providing uh, reporters with some additional details. The mayor, who uh, told us last night that he's getting about two hours of sleep a night, obviously pretty short-tempered, pretty testy, accusing uh, the media, he says, of uh, hoping that things might have been a little worse than they have been so far. Uh, obviously, the mayor's uh, ill temper uh, perhaps reflecting the fact that this is not going to be an easy or a quick fix. It's going to take a very long time. There's going to be a lot of water under the loop for a very long time. The big headline out of this briefing, beginning tonight at 8 o'clock, a portion of the loop is once again going to lose electricity. Tomorrow, a second portion of the loop is going to lose electricity. We will be giving you all of the details on those developments and other developments later on, Linda. All right, thank you, Mike. And of course, we will update you with the scheduled next briefing at 4 o'clock. And uh, unless events warrant it before then, we'll see you then. Thank you. This has been a special report from Channel 2 News. We now return to our regularly scheduled programming. This is a Channel 2 News special report. The Great Chicago Flood. You're looking live at the west bank of the Chicago River at Kinsey Street. Tonight, workers are beginning an operation there that will determine whether or not they can stop the leak that has swamped Chicago's loop. Good evening, and welcome to our special coverage of the great Chicago flood. It's been an extraordinary week in our city's history, a week of drama, uncertainty, anger, and frustration. We've also witnessed 
the truly inspiring ability of this city and its people to cope with adversity. For the next hour, we're going to look at what's happened and what lies ahead. But first, here's the latest. About one hour from now, Commonwealth Edison will turn out the lights on 57 more buildings in the South Loop to disconnect underwater transformers. Mayor Daly says recovery will be long. He says it could be days before all tunnels in the loop are finally drained. And on the scene of the leak, workers have sealed one side of the leaky tunnel, and tonight they begin the work of blocking off the other side. Channel 2's Jay Levine is on the scene. Tonight he has a first-hand look at what is being done with the men in charge. Jay? Bill, normally we're up 10 feet, 10 stories above the ground, high in a building, but now we've left the camera up there, and it's taking these pictures from about a quarter of a mile away. As we prepare to get a first-hand look, a guided tour, as it were, of the construction site. Exactly what they're doing and why, and we'll get it from the man who's in charge of the operation. Coming here to meet me is John Kenny. Hello, John. Hi, Jay. You can give us an idea of exactly what's going on here from the beginning, from the first hole that we come to, all the way to the work that's in progress now. This area here was bustling as recently as a couple of hours ago. Now it's empty. Correct. We've uh, completed uh, most of the work on this side. Uh, we'll be back in here about 8 o'clock tonight, uh, finishing off this particular hole, which is the second one that has seen most of the activity in the last couple days. And uh, we'll be coming in to top off the concrete, and uh, then tomorrow we will start to grout this particular shaft. Now, I'm looking down in, and uh, I can see down in the hole, and what I see is water about 20 feet down below the surface. What's below that? Uh, there's concrete below that. Um, the exact elevation, I can't tell you. I wasn't... Uh, uh, here when they finish topping it up, but we will bring that up to uh, the elevation above the water level uh, so that we can get on top of that concrete and we will we'll drill some long grout holes down into the tunnel and uh, grout the plug that we put in uh, earlier today and seal off the bottom. Now you're certain that this hole, this shaft, leading from the damaged area is now sealed? Not a hundred percent, but uh, we, we will be pretty sure tomorrow uh, when we complete this grouting phase uh, that we will seal this off. Now. The work has gone to the other side, so let's walk on over there if we can. We're walking now toward the Kinsey Street Bridge, which was the scene of all the efforts at first. You first went to the, you first went to the, the, the hole itself, underneath the riverbed, and tried to go there. Unsuccessful? No, I think that was probably, it was successful, because when I was first on the scene uh, and asked to participate, um, there was that's where the problem was and it was pretty evident that that's where the problem was uh, and I think that uh, we sat down and with a a fairly good group of people and determined that that we had to try and stop the problem in the in the river itself and I think we slowed the uh, flow down considerably. Now there was some talk right over here of building a levee a kind of a dike around uh, right. that was abandoned? Well it was because we were we were having such good success there and this was taking so much time to do this and all the operations going on simultaneously we decided just to concentrate our efforts in one spot and continue there so now we, we move uh, along the bridge and head toward the the pilings where where all this actually took place uh... the leak was just inside the pilings obviously we're going behind the bridge now so you can't see as we'll pop out here in in just a moment this is the spot this is the spot of the actual leak right down here Correct. The leak is occurring somewhere between the two pilings, um, down on the south side of the pilings. Now, I still see a swirl of water down there. Does that mean anything? No, it doesn't mean anything at all. You, you, every bridge that you can go on uh, that has these uh, protective pilings on, you'll see that same type of flow. Um, that's not anything uh, that we would worry about. Now, we saw a, a sonar device down there earlier today, little yellow torpedo-like device down there. What did it tell you? tells us basically what the condition of, the, of the, the bottom surface is and it can locate the hole for us. And what did it find as we walk along here to the other side of the bridge? Well, it obviously found a hole and uh, we don't have the computer printouts yet to tell us exactly what he did find. Uh, he can read the uh, computer uh, screen and tell us by his readings exactly what was there and, and locate the hole pretty closely. Now this tunnel, the service tunnel, is running just outside the outer rail of the river, right? Just about we're 20 right. feet? Correct. We're right, we're right outside the pilings. We're heading now for the, for the other side of the river, and over here you have the other holes that have been sunk down in so we can uh, to try and, and gauge exactly, uh, to, to seal it off from this side as well, because until this side is sealed, the system is still being flooded with water, is it not? Correct. At least some of them. Well, we're not sure, and I'm not sure what's being flooded. 
uh, we know that the, the water is going to the west. Now, as we walk down over here, Mayor Daly and uh, Fire Commissioner Orozco are being briefed by uh, uh, being briefed by those who are actually doing the work. He's been a he's been a constant visitor here, has he not? He's been here quite a bit. He spent quite a bit of time in the last few nights, uh, probably upwards of four and five hours, uh, you know, helping us, uh, giving us moral support. Mr. Mayor, we're live on Channel 2 right now with our hour special. Yeah. Are you pleased with the way all this work is going? Yes, I am. I think uh, 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 John, Kenny, and others uh, are, are doing an excellent job, all the workmen out here, and uh, are carrying on as they should do, worrying about the safety uh, of all the personnel here, especially the divers and uh, all the construction workers that are going down here. John said the thing that amazed him so far on the job is there's been not a single first aid injury. That's right. There has not been, uh, and that's what uh, the safety is first. Uh, uh, the general was out here uh, dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers, and he mentioned he's never seen uh, uh, all of government and the private sector move so rapidly uh, uh, and so quickly in, in, in uh, getting the people out of the loop Monday. He said you, that's a textbook right there, how you got a million people out, no injuries, no deaths in, in the whole construction phase of it. And then he talked about having all the uh, emergency services at 400 North Franklin, Army Corps of Engineers, everybody's involved in talking to one another about the problems. And, and all of them here tonight, as you notice from the other nights, uh, every time divers go down, it does take time because of the safety of the people involved. And you've been here. When the divers have gone down, right. you've been here. When they started pouring concrete, right. you were here. You've made it your business to be here. Right, because I think well, what we see, this is a, a disaster. Yes, it is. And, and at the same time, to see the commitment that everybody's making to, to stop this uh, uh, leak right away, and then from there handle the other problems that exist. Tell me, tell me how this is affecting you personally. I know you've gone through a lot of things in your life. You watched your father govern this city for two decades. Um, how does it compare? Well, I, uh, you know, it's hard. You know, when when my father was governing and making decisions, you know, I was there, and, and but you never, you know, the, the decisions that he had to make, uh, uh, never realized, uh, you know, how difficult they were. And uh, but I'm relying off of people like John Kenny and others here from in uh, Case International, other people who are the experts in this field. And Commissioner Orozco uh, behind me has done a you know, job uh, Monday morning at 9.30. That was the decision that was, that was the key in making that decision, making a decision uh, to close down parts of the loop and move the people out. Second guess yourself, hindsight is 2020. they say. No. Would you do anything differently if you had the choice over this week? No, I don't think so. I, no, I, I, I bet, you know, when you look back in a couple more months, which everybody will reviewing things, I doubt it now. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, the expertise involved and the commitment of safety of everybody and uh, of all the workforce. That is the key, and uh, it's a very delicate and dangerous uh, type of construction. Does it, does it make you, you've got to be torn to some extent. You have to look with pride upon the, the reaction of the city of right. Chicago and all these fine people. But you have to be somewhat annoyed and, and angered, as we've seen you, over the fact that this might have been prevented, that there might have been some negligence. Well, the infrastructure of America is collapsing. Everybody knows that. You know, take, you take the, the sewers, you take the bridges, you take the roads, you take tunnels. America is collapsing. I think you can go from Boston to L.A. to Miami. Everybody knows that. Your bridges, everything is collapsing. This is nothing new. Until America wakes up, uh, uh, you know, we have rebuilt Germany, we did the infrastructure, we have rebuilt Japan, we did the infrastructure. I hope we're not going to build Russia, the infrastructure. And I, I'm just saying, as America, if they don't rebuild infrastructure in America, unfortunately, you're going to see many, many of these instances, which you've had in the past, and they're going to continually arise because of the condition of the infrastructure of America. It's deteriorating and falling apart. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us. John Kenny, we'll come over here very, very briefly. We're, we're kind of out of time now. If we can skip in here, we can actually see the holes where they're working on now, and you can give me a, a first-hand view of, of, of exactly what they're doing here. I have to climb over things. Now, this is the hole where they're going to be going. Well, actually, we're going in on the other side first, but it's all the same. It's the same situation that we had on the other side. We'll take the downstream hole last. We'll take this one first and we'll put the uh, sandbags and the rock in this hole and seal it off uh, from the river and then we'll go in and we'll work and concentrate on the downstream side so that uh, you know we can get the divers in there and we'll start cleaning and we'll all this th is going to be done on a double shift starting right now. Fit by and finished? I you have an idea now based on what you found there. What's not, your Not guess? really because until we get down inside and find out how much material is down there we're hoping that this side is cleaner than the other side. We've spent all day over here 
cleaning different ways. We've used the fire department to jet it and everything else. So. Okay, we've got to get back. Okay. John Kenny, thank you very much for You're taking uh, time out of your busy schedule with uh, no sleep to join us. Bill, that's the latest from, from here. Now let's go back to you. Thanks, Jay. I would agree with the mayor. I've thought about it several times. Uh, Fire Commissioner Orozco having to come forward at 9.30 on Monday morning saying, Mr. Mayor, I would advise shutting down the loop. That's a pretty hard one. Uh, novels and movies are made about that, aren't they? The tragedy of the Great Flood is that it didn't have to happen. There were plenty of warnings, plenty of mistakes. Tonight, Channel 2's Mike Parker tells us how we got here in the first place. Michael? Bill, for five days now, we've watched the efforts to plug the leak. We've listened to all the technical explanations. And by now, we seem to have become armchair hydraulic and construction experts. But the story of the causes of this disaster, how it happened, is also something of a textbook case in bureaucratic bungling, neglect, and poor judgment. It's just a lot of little things that didn't happen that added up to one big disaster when it finally did happen. John LaPlante, the city commissioner fired 30 hours after the flooding began, is partially right when he says there were a lot of little things that didn't happen that helped cause this disaster. There were also a lot of things that did happen that helped create this billion dollar mess. In the fall of 1991, the city of Chicago hired a suburban company to replace pilings that protect bridges over the Chicago River from boat and barge traffic. The $335,000 contract included putting new pilings at the Kinsey Street Bridge. But the city changed some of the contract specifications with Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company of Oak Brook. Those changes may have led the tunnel to collapse. The original specs called for steel pipe pilings, which displace some of the river bottom into the pipe as they're pounded in. For some reason, the city called instead for wooden timber pilings, which increased the pressure on the river bottom and the tunnel below. For a location where there was a possibility of a tunnel under the river, the steel piles would have been a better choice. In the videotape shot in the Kinsey Street Tunnel in January, there's dramatic evidence that the wood pilings penetrated the tunnel. Listen and watch closely as the cable TV cameraman describes what he's shooting. This is not a cave. It appears to be a piling of some sort sunk in right next to the tunnel here. I count probably three deep and three across. They look like they're wood. There are other suspicious aspects to the project. Great Lakes failed to remove the old installation as the contract required. Great Lakes placed the new pilings in a spot that seemingly made tunnel damage inevitable. You never put piles near a tunnel that's underwater. It's something that's not done. But it was done, and the disaster clock began ticking. Still, the fact that there was trouble in the tunnel was not discovered until mid-January, three months after the pilings had been installed. It was then that the videotape of the damage was shot. Pictorial evidence of the cracking and crumbling, the three to four feet of mud and silt. And a few weeks later, in February, the city's Department of General Services was notified. But the first city inspection did not take place until March 13th. On March 16th, the Department of Transportation was notified. Nine days later, there was yet another inspection. Then on April 2nd, the seriousness of the problem was detailed in an internal memo from Chief Bridge Engineer Louis Kunza to Acting Transportation Commissioner John LaPlante. In it, Kunza tells LaPlante, this wall failure should be repaired immediately due to the potential danger of flooding out the entire freight tunnel system. LaPlante did not act to repair the tunnel immediately as an emergency procurement project. Instead, he began a time-consuming process of seeking bids. It didn't occur to me that that this was a serious problem because the we did know that the damage was due to the pilings going in back in September and uh, since there had not been any problem since September it didn't it didn't wasn't aware that there could be a problem that quick is it would another week or two make a difference uh, obviously it did now the city corporation council is continuing to investigate the causes an investigation that's already led to one firing john laplante the will there be others fired or punished this investigation is extremely preliminary we have made no conclusions about the kind of specific questions you're asking there's a lot of little things if the contractor hadn't uh, uh, 
put his pilings without getting uh, outside uh, advice on where to put them. If our uh, uh, people had gotten copies of the tapes earlier, uh, there's a lot of ifs, and they all add up to to the situation. If if it had been caught at any one of these four or five or six different places, we could have stopped it. Investigators have more questions for more people in the days ahead, and they're continuing their search for documents which may help them find out for sure who knew what and when did they know it. They are being propelled by the anger of a mayor who feels that some people in his administration let him down. Privately, Richard Daly is promising to deal quickly and harshly with, and this is how he puts it, anybody who has his fingerprints on this. That's his responsibility, but that's the best evidence that I have seen so far. To me, there's no question anymore. And I miss the evidence in the videotape. Yeah, that's I missed that the first time around. I think uh, many people did. We were so taken by the, the pictorial content of that videotape, we didn't listen carefully to the words that were being spoken, and sure enough, there they were. This is not a cave-in, the cameraman said. Look, there are wood pilings here, three across and three deep that have penetrated the tunnel. I can see them, right? It's amazing, there. yeah, amazing evidence. We have not been able to talk to the cameraman since that. My I understand. I'm there. told he has uh, something of a, a family problem and has just does not want to get involved in uh, the, the media play of all this right now. Thank you, Michael. It can be hard to understand what's being done to stop the leak, and so we built a model. Up next, we'll use that model to show you exactly what is happening right now beneath the river. And later, the men of the river. John Drummond takes us on a journey with the men who see our city from a much different perspective. While workers check water levels in the sewers there. Now, earlier this week, some water did come through the pavement in the same area because of flooding in the loop. Crews say there is no danger of the expressway flooding right now, but they don't know yet when all lanes of traffic will reopen. It's hard to picture what is happening beneath the river, so we built a model to better understand it. Channel 2's Larry Menty can tell us what's being done right now to stop the leak. Larry? Bill, not only do we have our model to show you what's going on step by step, but we also have Shane Albertson, who has a unique perspective of what's been going on. He's one of the divers, one of the real heroes in the process to plug up the leak under the Kinsey Street Bridge. And as we show you the model, he's going to describe what's been happening under there. Let's start right from the beginning and go over to where the leak is, the pilings that came down into the Kinsey Street Tunnel. Shane, why didn't they attack the leak right here? I think uh, the main reason they didn't attack the leak right there is it was uncontrolled. Uh, if the diver went down through that hole, the possibility of this, all this mud and debris caving in on him was there. This is too dangerous here. Yes. And that's why these two tunnels, these two shafts were drilled. And this shaft was to slow the current, slow the flow to allow the divers to work. Sandbags were poured down the shaft furthest away from the river. Sandbags, gravel was poured down, 2,000 sandbags, gravel, and then some concrete filled here. Now, was there any concern ever as you were down in the tunnel that these sandbags would let loose? Uh, the concern was there, yes. Uh, if that were to happen, what would happen to you? The flow would start up again and the diver would, would end up in the flow somewhere over in here. And the, the toughest part about that, the top side wouldn't be able to pull him back. So you'd just be vertical, trying to fight this flow, they'd be up there with the air hose trying to drag you up, and it was almost an impossible exactly. task. Okay, what happened uh, yesterday and today is that the diver came down through this shaft, now that the flow was low enough to support the diver down here. There you are, coming down in that torpedo through the shaft. That's a 35-foot drop. What is, what's it like being in there? It's kind of tight. It's uh, the pipe is only five foot diameter. Are you, are you claustrophobic at all? No, can't be. <laughs> you can't be in this job, I guess. Then you went down yesterday and today, and you were removing the uh, silt and the debris from the bottom. Was that a difficult process? Yeah, it was pretty difficult. Uh, we used a submersible pump. First, we used an airlift, but uh, we found out the pump worked better. And all the gravel was so tight. It was tight. And after that was taken out, you, had, you were starting to put concrete in. You were, a, you were a mason as well. Tell me about that process while I pile this up. Well, once we removed uh, the debris necessary for the concrete pour, we had to clean it out. Uh, they brought in a couple of dump trucks, cement trucks. We poured it down into here and filled up the bottom. Under the water, though, what were you dealing with at this point? 
Once they started pouring, I was up here, and as as they started pouring, I jumped down to position the concrete, push it over in the low spots. Now, what they're doing tonight is they're going to start pouring some concrete in to fill this shaft. They're also going to uh, drill a hole through the middle of the two shafts, put some grout in between here. Grout is the same, almost the same kind of stuff you'd use in the tiles in your bathroom, right. filling up this to fill this crack. You have this, you're going to do it on the same side, on the west side. You dive tomorrow, you dive this morning. Let me ask you something. You've been in these tunnels before. You've seen this firsthand. Is this going to stop it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know... People designed it. I just placed the concrete, but I think uh, I think it's going to work. Now the last job that Shane Albertson was on, he was down in the bottom of a nuclear reactor. He's a hero for hire. He comes to these things all the time, and we're sure glad that you came here. Bill, sounds like this is something of a vacation almost, Shane. Good to have you in town, Larry and Shane. The Great Chicago Flood begs a frightening question: Is our city falling apart. Mayor Daly alluded to the crumbling infrastructure. Up next, the aging structures that support our city and if we have reason to worry. I is live now in the loop and can give us an update, Dawn. Bill, we're here in the heart of the total power shutdown in this part of the loop. In about a half an hour, the lights go off and so does all the electricity for 57 buildings. Now let's show you the areas affected here. Adams to the north, we're going to see Congress to the south, then Dearborn to the west, and all the buildings up to Michigan Avenue to the east. Now this will go on for 12 hours. The big question though tonight is why, and here to explain that part of it more is the Vice President of Commonwealth Edison, Tom Amon. Tom, thanks for joining us tonight. Why do you need to shut down the power to so many buildings? Well, these buildings are served from a network uh, made up of various vaults throughout the city under the sidewalks. Uh, Monday when the water came, three of those vaults flooded right up to the top. And so we now have electrical equipment that's been operating for five days underwater. Normally that's not a problem. These uh, vaults are designed with equipment that is submersible, however, not intended to be operated forever underwater. So does that mean there's a danger involved in this? A, a danger of possibly an outage, because as the water stands, it gets dirty, it gets possibly contaminated, but more importantly, it becomes conductive. And that means we could have some flashovers and possibly that vault would go out of service and knock these buildings out of service at an unknown time. We'd rather do it, and so would the building owners, at a known predictable okay. time. And we are going to see some more known predictable times over the, ne over the next couple of days, Tom? No, we, these are the last two vaults. Uh, we have one in this area, and then the other area that you uh, were going to mention, uh, north of uh, that's tomorrow morning. Uh, Monroe, that's right, between Dearborn and, and uh, the river. Tom, thank you for joining us sure. tonight. Bill, back to you. And Don, thanks. Thank Tom, uh, Tom for us. He's been up with everybody else, trying to keep everyone informed. Formed. Of course, the flooding in the loop raises serious questions about the aging structures of our city. Just how sturdy and how secure are they? Shuttle 2's Mike Flannery is here to tell us. Do we have reason to worry, Michael? The simple answer, Bill, is yes. While Chicago is better off than many of America's aging big cities, all of us have been out and we've seen those places where the city seems literally to be falling apart. We asked one expert to walk us through some of those specific places and another to give us the big picture of our crumbling city. Chicago and its infrastructure are simply getting old. Like the tunnel that collapsed beneath the Chicago River, much of the city's infrastructure, its water mains, its sewers, its roads, and its bridges date back almost 100 years. The original L tracks that crisscrossed the loop were built in 1897 a time when most people still traveled by horse and buggy. Parts of the seawall, which protects the city's shoreline from the ravages of Lake Michigan, were constructed during the Depression. It is aging, like your house is aging, like your automobile is aging. Professor Sidney Goralnik is a civil engineer who studies the infrastructure of big cities. Cities are getting more complicated rather than less complicated. More buildings are going into the loop larger buildings putting ever greater strains on all of the infrastructure. The facilities are not getting simpler, they're more complicated. They require more maintenance, they require more attention. It will also require huge amounts of money. 
Over the next four years, the city says it needs $102 million for bridge repair work alone, $163 million for sewer improvements, $211 million for streets and sidewalks, and $291 million for water system modernization. The Chicago Transit Authority wants to spend a whopping $2 billion for repairs during the same time period. We're going to have to find new ways of constructing and replacing to be able to afford to give to our children what our parents and grandparents have given to us. Cities play on the margins of safety. Professor Paul Barrett has made a career of studying Chicago's bridges, roadways, and train tracks. He calls them the city's invisible infrastructure because people don't really notice them until something goes wrong or like the Michigan Avenue Bridge until they're shut down for repair. Things like bridges tend to get patched in a minimal way. That's not just a Chicago tradition, it's an urban tradition. You do the least you can, you do it as cheaply as you can. The Michigan Avenue Bridge opened in 1920, and people have been talking about repairing it for the last 30 years. But work only began last year. It is an example of something right in the middle of your town, in the most famous part of your town, that you wait as long as you can to take care of. There's no reward for fixing things. There's mainly a reward for making new things. The elevated tracks that crisscrossed the loop were new in the 1890s. You're looking at a structure that's been neglected really since the 1920s. And the structure is slowly falling down. This is the Lake Street line at Canal. When it was built, it was a modern marvel of mass transit. Now, wooden planks are in place to protect people down below from falling debris. The trains are ordered to crawl through here at 10 miles an hour because the tracks can't stand the stress of higher speeds. This structure used to carry three tracks. It used to run express trains, as they do in New York. Slowly, slowly, just through neglect and deterioration, it's been scaled back to two tracks, and it's under slow orders. That's the beginnings of an incremental disaster. Many of the sewers downtown are deteriorating, too. They're expected to last about 20 years more but they're being repaired so slowly that it may be 300 years before the whole system can be overhauled. This is what happens when it's too late. The Ogden Avenue overpass, a direct access route from the north side to the west side, closed and crumbling. The city didn't care enough or didn't have enough money to keep it operating, so I can take it apart with my hands and I'm an old man. Now the truth is that not all of these structures are worth fixing. But the ones that are, it's going to take billions of dollars to save, money that politicians at every level say they don't have. And up until now, there has been no outcry from the voters to find the money. We'll see if the tunnel disaster here in Chicago is going to change any of that, Bill. Michael, you scare me to death. Jay Levine is going to update us from the scene of the leak after a break. Also, Linda McLennan looks back at the drama that has played out all week long beneath the Kinsey Street Bridge. And life on the river. Tonight, the men who live on Chicago's waterways. There's a lot of activity going on right now. Let's take a look down right behind me, and we can see the scene right below. The truck you can see has just dumped a load of gravel down into the hole, the second hole, the hole furthest away. They have already filled that hole with sandbags, and so now there's gravel on top of sandbags, and that creates the temporary dam, which will be used so the divers can get down into the other hole and start putting the concrete down in. Now, I was asked just a couple of moments ago by Fire Commissioner Orozco to pass along a message. He heard us talking to the mayor, knew we were on live, and he's making this request to those owners of buildings downtown who are employing some divers, as we've seen earlier in the week, to check out their basements, to check and see what's going on down in their flooded basements. He's asking anyone who's employing a diver to check out anything anywhere in the city to notify the fire department first. He says there's a reason why they have ambulances standing by here on the scene whenever there are divers down. He wants to be careful and he wants to know what's going on in the city with divers. So that's the situation here up to the minute. It's going very, very fast here. A lot of activity. We'll keep you posted, Bill. And that's good news. We'll pass that along. 
indeed the Board of Trade as some of those divers. That picture from high above the Kinsey Street Bridge is an image that is now part of our city's history. For five days we have watched from above as divers and engineers have worked around the clock to plug the leak. Tonight, Linda McLennan is here with a look back at the extraordinary events this week as they unfolded before our eyes. Linda? Bill, it has truly been an historic week in the life of this city. So much has happened, and yet, in other ways, it seems so little has happened. Let's go back to early Monday morning. The Loop was waking up to the start of another work week. But this was a week that would turn the heart of this city upside down. Day one, Monday. The trash swirling on the surface of the Chicago River hardly seems like cause for alarm. But 40 feet below, river water is rushing through a tunnel leak and is already flooding the basements of two dozen buildings in the loop. By 9 a.m., water is gushing into the basement of City Hall, reaching 11 feet deep, and the hall is closed to the public. We have called uh, not only the Corps of Engineers, our own department, private people to come in and try to correct the situation as soon as possible. By 11 a.m., the loop is being evacuated as power is cut off to buildings with flooded basements. The Board of Trade falls silent. Traders make their way down stairways in the dark. You don't make money, but you don't lose money. Not many people recognize the magnitude of the economic disaster yet. Shutting down and sending home an estimated 250,000 downtown workers. Early estimates put the losses at $40 million for just one day. Firefighters and work crews begin the laborious battle of the pumps and hoses, trying to bring down water levels to minimize the damage. Deserted loop streets become a tangle of gushing hoses and emergency trucks. Back at the Kinsey Bridge, the site of the leak, a game plan emerges, but everyone is improvising. Try to plug the hole with anything, anything that might work. At first, there's optimism. We're hoping to, to push the stone on, seal the mud, and everything and cause a, uh, uh, to limit the flow. Dump trucks bring in rocks and gravel. A barge loaded with mattresses arrives on the scene. Quick drying cement is poured through a hose. But by nightfall, there is little sign of progress. In the darkened loop, an extra 215 police officers patrol the empty streets. And they have a message for would-be looters. Well, there's more of us than there is of you, so think twice about it. We're ready. While deep underground, weary contractors and volunteers toil on into the night to pump out basements. Along with exhaustion, they face danger from gas fumes belched out by pump generators. We're not getting enough ventilation in here. The work goes on round the clock. Day two, Tuesday, an angry Mayor Daly fires a city official who he says ignored a warning months ago of potential problems. A videotape shot in January by a cable TV company clearly shows early signs of damage to the tunnel wall. And attention focuses on those river pilings, the likely culprits in this disaster. Prospects for plugging the leak seem as murky as the river water still pouring into the Board of Trade basement, where a diver is lowered into 25 feet of water. Our main objective is, number one, make sure our four-inch pipes cut the wires going inside and then put caps on, cap all three off. We've got to do that. We hope to have that done tonight for sure. Marshall Fields and other downtown businesses begin to tote up their losses. Estimates now running as high as $500 million if it takes two weeks to dry out the loop. Currently, the, the impact is dramatic because we're not able to open for business, uh, and we can't do that until the city gets the water out of, the, out of our third sub-basement. Day three, Wednesday. It seems each step forward is followed by two steps back. The water is still rising at City Hall, now seeping into the pedway to the state of Illinois Center. President Bush declares downtown Chicago a federal disaster area. And as night rain lashes the Kinsey site, New heroes emerge from the crisis, divers lowered into darkness to assess the damage. Day four, Thursday. Those divers give us our first view of the tunnel leak provided by cameras attached to their helmets. Does that feel like good solid concrete in the tunnel? Yeah, it feels pretty strong. That's a fish that's swimming by. Later, bathed in the floodlights at the Kinsey Bridge, progress in clearing some of the debris from the tunnel bottom with a hand-operated electric pump. In the loop, a ComEd transformer in the basement of Marshall Fields remains under 20 feet of water. For safety reasons, 
engineers prepare to temporarily cut off power to seven more downtown buildings. And with a flick of a switch, the buildings go dark. It may be a fitting image for a crisis that could cost Chicago's downtown a billion dollars or more before it's over. And from every indication tonight, this may not be over for a long time. Bill? Been quite a week. The great Chicago flood has opened our eyes to another lifestyle that few of us ever see. Life on the river. Tonight, Channel 2's John Drummond tells us about the river men who see our city from a much different perspective. They call them river rats, the men and women who toil on towboats and barges that haul freight through America's heartland. The hours are long, and time sometimes hangs heavy. But you can never let your guard down. There's a lot of traffic, and the channel of a river or canal can often be treacherous. You constantly have shallow water problems uh, with the nine-foot barges. The, the channel fluctuates. Watching your uh, suction, the canal is narrow, you will suck into the banks. That's just a natural characteristic of operations. And if you have a configuration of a tow of empties, you always have a, to watch it closely in the wind, you can have a wind problem. Barges that ply their trade in the Chicago waterway system carry a variety of freight. Cement, chemicals, coal, grain, petroleum, scrap iron and steel, just to name a few. The barges are huge, each barge 35 feet wide and 195 to 200 feet long. To give you an idea how much cargo a barge can hold, the load of one barge is the equivalent of 15 jumbo hoppers, or the equivalent of 58 trucks. The size of the crews vary. Some that make long haul, say from Chicago to New Orleans, carry a crew of 11 or 13. Now this towboat, the Emily B, has a crew of six. The men work 21 days on and then 21 days off. River rats get the bug early, beginning as deckhands when they are teenagers. Master pilot Jim Taylor, an Arkansas native, has been in the business for 34 years. Those men out here on deck work very hard. It's very dangerous. They work in all kinds of weather. It doesn't matter whether it's raining or snowing or 20 below. They have to go. The sweeping quarters aren't like the Queen Mary, but they are comfortable. Each room has a sink, shower and toilet facilities are nearby. The flooding in downtown Chicago is also affecting barge traffic. Some boats on the Chicago River have literally been left at the dock. This barge loaded with scrap iron is destined for New Orleans. But the trip to the Crescent City has been put on hold until the Chicago River is open again to traffic. And traffic on the ship and sanitary canal in the Sag Channel has also been affected since the Army Corps of Engineers opened the locks at Lockport, lowering the river level. So we can't get to any of these docks or sillies up there. We've had this boat here lay by here all night last night just to see if the water level will come up any. Right now we're going to try taking a chance with the barge load that's drawn eight foot and these three empties to try to get them up there so we at least you know, get some barges moving and then deliver to these docks. Despite the low river level, the crews do the best they can. A trip to the kitchen helps break the monotony. At speeds of two to three miles an hour, time seems to stand still. But it's a life the river rats have chosen, and they're a friendly lot. Give them a greeting when you see them, and I guarantee they'll wave right back. John Drummond, Channel 2 News. What happens when the water recedes after a break? Tonight, Channel 2's Elizabeth Vargas tells us what happens when the water is gone. I'd say the water, I suspect, um, at the point of entry was very high. They are experts in the power of water. We start to look for cracks in the concrete slab. The power to destroy. Not until basements are drained, until they are clear of the murky Chicago River, will anyone know just how much is lost. Sitting in, the, in a basement for two weeks, the water has a chance to soak into various materials into the basement area. Um, we're talking about soaking up in the drywall that will totally destroy the drywall partitions. Um, it soaks into masonry. It's going to take an awful long time to dry out the masonry. Once the water is drained out of the countless basements in the loop, architectural and engineering experts will have to come and inspect each and every basement, checking for cracks in the walls and for floors that are buckling. What we'll be looking for once this basement dries out is the effects of the weight of this water on top of the floor slab. Because uh, for every foot of water that you have in here, that's about 64 pounds a square foot. So if you have 10 feet of water, that's uh, 640 pounds a square foot, which far exceeds what the floor was designed to take. The floors could be buckling. The floors could be buckling. 
Once the buildings are declared safe, the long process of drying them out begins. It is not enough to stop the flow, to drain the water. We're looking at two weeks now of flooding. Two weeks, possibly, before they get the water out of these buildings. How much longer after that until everything's dried out and life is back to normal for these people? Uh, that's going to be a real tough call. Uh, I would say in a building the size of this, 10 to 14 days. Uh, to that's dry after the water's after out. After the water's out. Dale Glanz has already begun vacuuming out the moisture in Carson Peary Scott. Huge yellow hoses pour dry air in and flush moisture out. This is where we take the outside air into the machinery. Whatever the moisture level in the air is, it then goes through the machine to a desiccant dehumidification wheel. Making Basically, it like a desert. It's a big sponge. And all we're doing is changing the air. That's all we're doing. It's changing moist air for dry, for dry air. air. Exactly. The water can eat away at buildings and everything inside, causing corrosion to metals and wiring. Mold and mildew can form in walls and floors. Material damage to many boilers that have been submerged and structural damage to walls and floors. Engineers are also concerned about the velocity of the water when it gushed through loop basements. The power probably damaged walls as the river rushed through. They are also concerned about the hundreds of workers who have waded through the murky floods. Hundreds have been getting tetanus shots. As the water sits, the bacteria in it grows and could cause infections. Each and every building will have to be sanitized with chlorine and ventilated to remove harmful germs. In food establishments, uh, we want to be sure that the uh, surfaces uh, that contact food and so forth are properly cleaned and properly sanitized. We wouldn't want to have any cross-contamination. The Great Chicago Flood is far from over. The cleanup work, the job of measuring its damage, has not even begun. Elizabeth Vargas, Channel 2 News. It's been an extraordinary week in Chicago. Up next, some final thoughts on five days that brought Chicago's loop to its knees. Admitted to being tired. They realize the job has to be done, and they're doing it. Let's take another look down below, ten stories below, and we still see Mayor Richard M. Daley. Still waiting, still watching, still keeping a close eye on the progress that's being made. And indeed, there is progress being made. Because just to the left, about 25 feet from the mayor, you can see that one of the holes is already filled in. The hole furthest from the river filled in to stop the current so they can start uh, digging out and start siphoning, suctioning up the mud and dirt which is down at the bottom. So if they can do that in, what, an hour since we've been here, this job, I think, will go relatively fast. Bill, that's a status report up to the minute from here. And it's a good one. We'll see you at 10. Thanks, Jay. Chicago has faced a number of disasters over the years. There have been tornadoes, floods, blizzards. However, not since the Great Chicago Fire has the city faced a crisis that has created such a feeling of helplessness. What can bring a city to a standstill? The answer lies beneath the surface of the Chicago River, the leak that paralyzed Chicago. The last time Chicago was witness to such an event was about 120 years ago, when, as rumor has it, a cow kicked over a lantern and started a fire that would burn for two days and leave Chicago little more than a pile of rubble. In 1871, it came down to individual spirit and dirt to put out the great Chicago fire. 100 years later, with all the technology we've produced, our solution to the great Chicago flood comes down to individual spirit and dirt. In 1871, the death toll was 300. 100,000 were left homeless. The damage rang in at $40 million. Today, the proportions are different. No one was killed. No one left homeless. But the cost to the city, to its industry, to its businesses, to its buildings is unimaginable. The heart of Chicago's financial district stopped beating for two days. The Board of Trade, World Center for Futures, shut down. Billions of lost opportunities, billions of lost dollars. In 1871, rebuilding the city from scratch began immediately, using steel instead of wood, thanks to Mayor Joseph Medill's new codes. We built fast, and we built big. As a result, today, recovering from a leak, seems more complicated an operation than rebuilding a city burnt to the ground. And all we're trying to do is to get back on track. Crews work around permanent structures, trying to save the buildings from permanent damage. 
Water, water, everywhere. I think we've learned what makes Chicago the city that works. It's another city underground, just a few feet from where we walk every day, connecting us with electricity, telephones, television. And if you want to hurt us, that's a good place to start. The city's nervous system, a maze of circuits that bring us the power to use tools of the modern world, was vulnerable. The core of our underground transportation system stopped, and we're not exactly sure when we'll see it operating again. The last time Marshall Fields was closed for this period of time was after the fire in 1871. Back then, they reopened in a stable the very next day. We haven't done as well this time. Who would have thought, almost as far from the ocean as you can get, divers have become our lifeline? For that matter, who would believe that pilings under a bridge would have the same significance a cow and a lantern has had? for 100 years. It's been a week unlike we've ever seen before in Chicago, and it's not over yet. Our reporters and camera crews are on the scene as they have been all week, recording history as it happens. Stay tuned to Channel 2 later tonight, throughout the weekend, for the latest on the Great Chicago Flood. Oh, Bill Curtis, Linda McLennan, Steve Baskerville with AccuWeather, Johnny Morris on sports, and the Channel 2 News team. This is Channel 2 News at 10. Good evening. Five days after we first learned that Chicago was under siege from an underground flood, there is finally a glimmer of hope. You are looking live at the front lines of the battle against the flood. Divers have sealed off the tunnel on the east side of the river. If they can succeed here on the west side, they'll take a giant step toward ending the crisis. But Lights are still going out in certain parts of the loop tonight, and workers are still struggling in dark, flooded tunnels. Signs there's still a lot of work to do. And there are some disturbing reports involving the city's train system that could mean trouble for commuters Monday morning. But for the first time tonight, there is some good news to report. Channel 2's Jay Levine has been tracking developments at the Kinsey Street construction site all week. He joins us now live with the latest on efforts to plug that leak. Jay? Linda, they started placing temporary plugs on two of the holes just about 7 o'clock tonight. But they've made so much progress so fast that they've kind of outstripped their interference. And they're not yet ready to begin the second phase of the operation. What took days on the east side of the river is being done in hours tonight. Sandbags dumped, crews feverishly tossing them down the drop shaft. Mayor Daly standing a few feet away watching the operation shift into high gear. Gravel trucks dumping their loads until the shafts overflowed with stone. And then we'll go in and we'll work and concentrate on the downstream side so that uh, you know, we can get the divers in there and we'll start cleaning. And we'll, all this is going to be done on a double shift starting right now. John Kenny had taken us from one end of the project to the other, explaining why some things were done while others weren't. When we ran into the mayor, it was clear the man Kenny reports to was pleased. The expertise involved and a commitment of safety of everybody and uh, of all the workforce, that is the key. And uh, it's a very delicate and dangerous uh, type of construction. So far tonight, they've done in two holes on the west side exactly what they did on the east side, filling them in with sandbags and gravel to slow down the flow of water so that divers could prepare the other shafts for the concrete plugs. They first started pouring concrete on the east side at 11 this morning. By 5, they called the operation a success. We think we've achieved a very good seal down in the bottom and have shut off the water on the east side of the bridge. Steel piping is being prepared tonight for use in pumping concrete down the two west bank shafts. But even as crews appear on the verge of finally sealing off the damaged section of tunnel and stopping the flow of water to the tunnels and basements of the loop, the mayor said there's a lesson from all this. If they don't rebuild infrastructure in America, Unfortunately, you're going to see many, many of these instances, which you've had in the past, and they're going to continually arise because of the condition of the infrastructure of America. It's deteriorating and falling apart. Johnny Kenny talked about the double shifts. Well, you can see all those workmen still down there tonight. The thick hoses you see just to the right of the holes, those are the holes that will be used to evacuate the bottom of the tunnel to clean out the surfaces underneath in that service tunnel so they can start pouring the concrete, make the seal, and do the permanent plug. That should get underway sometime tomorrow. It took them a lot longer on the other side, but now they say they know how to do it, and they're ready to push on ahead. We're live above the Kinsey Street worksite. I'm Jay Levine, Channel 2 News. Now back to you. 
Thank you, Jay. Restoring and keeping power in the loop is a top priority tonight, and it's exactly for that reason the ComEd is actually cutting power in two areas. Just two hours ago, power to 57 buildings in the South Loop was turned off. The buildings are in an area bounded by Adams, Congress, Michigan, and Dearborn. Their power had been coming from equipment that is now underwater. Tomorrow morning, another 19 buildings will be disconnected during a second power cutoff, affecting the area from Calhoun to the river and Dearborn to Monroe. Channel 2's Dawn Stensland joins us live with details on the latest loop blackout. Dawn? Bill, we are in the heart of that blackout. You look around at all these buildings and it looks eerie because there's not a light on here. But the real work is going on down below. We're right here in one manhole where three men are working fast and furious. You can see them welding and wiping. They're working to reroute a transformer from the transformers that are all submerged in the flooded waters. For these workers down below, it's going to be a long night. With the flip of a switch, every light goes off, and eerie darkness dominates the South Loop skyline. How's it going down there? Good, real good. So far, so good. Long night? Yeah, it's starting right now. It's going to be a long night. Long weekend, too, we understand. Commonwealth Edison workers say they're working fast to reroute power from three transformers that are submerged in floodwaters right now. They're actually in the process of killing one of the feeders that go to the pole. They were breaking down a Y joint, and we're going to drop off the lid that goes into one of the transformers that's buried underneath water. The crew will be here till 8 o'clock till the next crew comes on. Then we'll go home for 12 hours, and we'll come back next day for 12 hours. The pressure is on these workers to get this job done by sunup. Uh, it's been long this week, but it's going to get longer, because when, when, when they fix all this stuff, we're going to have longer nights than we've had. It has to be done. And uh, like this, the diver said yesterday, the pay's good, but uh, you also have a responsibility to Chicago. Okay, right now, Chris Gibbs, one of the workers you just saw is coming up. Chris, have you got this job done? Uh, we're just about done, another half hour or so. You expect to work through what? Seven in the morning, eight in the morning? We'll be here about eight, eight o'clock in the morning. We'll be here till. You guys are doing a good job. Long week ahead next week? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. But it's, it's not just me. It's, it's the whole Edison crew. Um, everybody's pitching in. Right. Chris Gibbs, thanks for joining us. Like I say, it's going to be a long night for these workers. It's a dirty, messy, smelly job down here. We're live from the loop, a dark loop tonight. I'm Dawn Stensland, Channel 2 News. Dawn, thank you. Power problems are just part of the story in the loop tonight. Flood water standing in basements poses a number of potential dangers. And the longer the water sits there, the greater those risks are. Water has now been sitting in basements for five days. Among the possible dangers, shifting buildings as water undermines the sand that lies under much of the loop. Water toxins and bacteria that can cause disease if they come in contact with bare skin. And air pollution from decaying plant and fish life in the water itself as well as from carbon monoxide produced by the motors on pumps. To minimize the danger, workers are wearing protective gloves, and portable pumps now are allowed only to be operated in well-ventilated spaces. There are other potential health risks as well, and the city is providing free tetanus shots to anyone who has been working on flood duty. The shots are just in case anyone gets a cut or a puncture during the cleanup. The tetanus shots will be given at the Daly Center, and if you've had a shot within the last decade, you probably won't need another one. A tetanus shot protects for about 10 years and sometimes longer. Segments of Chicago's mass transit system are feeling the effects of the flood. Water and subway tunnels is curtailing CTA service. It could be at least two more weeks before the underground trains run again. And rail service could be in big trouble too. There's concern that the pressure of standing water is shifting the ground beneath Union Station. Tonight, surveyors are monitoring the ground there to catch any movement. And John Duncanson is live with the latest. John? Bill, we may find movement in just a minute here because right behind me, here comes a train going northbound. I want to point out that these rail lines are not sinking yet. But there is concern by both Metra and by Amtrak, and we're going to let this go by us, it's coming quite close, that uh, leakage into that subway tunnel, the Dearborn subway tunnel, could disrupt things enough that uh, they could have some problems here. And so they have a full-time survey crew coming through the weekend, working every half an hour to make sure that there is no sinkage. Because if there is sinkage on this rail line, this area, the north area, will be cut off to rail traffic.
the rumbling of train wheels over a rail bed in question tonight. In question because of this leakage in a subway tunnel deep below ground. Just above the track, drilling crews are working to dig down to the Dearborn subway tunnel. We're looking for moisture leakage into the subway. Are you finding it? Uh, no, not right now. The Amtrak rail lines lie north of Union Station under the Lake Street Bridge. The Dearborn subway lies under a leaking freight tunnel. The rail track runs above at ground level. The fear is that the subway area will destabilize and the tracks will sink. That's why engineers Jerry Pitson and his brother Don are surveying to see if the tracks have dropped. Everything is normal at this point. We were looking for some settlement in the tracks, um, but found nothing. So everything is safe. Everything looks good right now. Well, we certainly can't tell whether these tracks are sinking uh, as this train goes by, but uh, rail uh, officials, Amtrak and Metro officials do have 10 cars filled with ballast ready to uh, fill in this area if it does begin to sink. So they are serious enough about it, but at the same time they say all of this is just precautionary. They aren't saying that it is sinking, they're just worried in case it does. We're live at the Amtrak, uh, the Amtrak tracks. Um, just outside the loop, I'm John Duncanson, Channel 2 News. Thank you, John. The loop flooding is having an impact on traffic far beyond the borders of Chicago. That's because hundreds of barges that bring everything from scrap iron to lumber here are stranded now that the river is closed at Kinsey. Each barge can carry as much as 58 trucks, showing how important they are to moving goods. Boats in other rivers and canals have also been affected. That's because the Army Corps of Engineers has lowered water levels to ease pressure on the collapsed section of tunnel. The shutdown has also stranded hundreds of pleasure boaters that normally pass under the Kinsey Street Bridge to reach the lake. Among those gritting their teeth through this crisis are dentists and their patients. The disaster has forced dozens of dentists from their loop offices and leaving many patients in the lurch. But the spirit of helping that arises in times of trouble is making it a little less painful. The Chicago Dental Association is matching up flooded out dentists with those who have extra office space. Dr. Paul Landman volunteered the use of space that's vacant with him because his partner is on maternity leave. How much are you charging for the extra space? Nothing. I'm not charging at all. I mean, if I were in the same boat, I don't think I'd want someone to take advantage of me for being in an uncomfortable situation. No, I'm not charging at all. The closed Pittsfield building normally houses 86 dentists. The 25 West Washington building is home to 53 dentists. Patients who can't reach their dentist because of the flood should call the Dental Society. Loop area businesses shut down by the flood can relocate to McCormick Place. Temporary space is being offered free of charge at least through until May 24th. In all, there is 60,000 square feet available. To find out more, business owners can call the Metropolitan Pier and Exposition Authority. The number to call there is 312-791-6290. That number again, 791-6290. For the workers affected by the flood, jobless benefits are now being made available, and many downtown employees that we spoke to said that they will claim them. Many workers, especially the hundreds of Marshall Fields employees, are paying a big price. They showed up at work today, but only to pick up their paychecks. They probably won't see another paycheck for at least a couple of weeks. They stopped being paid on Monday. Uh, we're, that's why we're working so hard to get the store up. I mean, it's, it's a minute-by-minute minute kind of thing. We're getting a lot of cooperation from the city, a lot of cooperation from uh, experts that we've brought in, uh, experts on disaster control, experts on rewiring systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we have no estimate at this point when we're going to open. Meanwhile, at Carson Peary Scott, managers were on the job today, taking inventory and doing some cleanup work. The managers are also calling employees to tell them that they can report to other Carson stores and work there until the Loop store reopens. More of our expanded coverage of the Loop flooding just ahead. They'll be working well into the night, moving closer to finally plugging the leak at the Chicago River. Zooming again on the east side, the east bank of the Chicago River. What you see are work crews back on the site. As John Kenny told us earlier this evening, they are pumping out some water which is on top of the concrete plug. 
uh, sticking up into the shaft, the pylon. They're going to pump that out and put new concrete in there tonight. You see the cement mixers in the background there in the right-hand corner of your picture, upper right-hand corner of your picture. They are working there tonight to put some more concrete down in that hole, still hoping that that plug that they have on the east bank will hold. Now, as we pan across the Chicago River, past the uh, cranes and the Chicago River Bridge, past the hole where the leak occurred, and all the way to the west bank, we see now that work over here is pretty well stopped. They've done as much as they can do over here now, as much as they plan to do. Down there, you can see uh, by the hole, John Kinney is wearing that chartreuse coat. He's in charge of the operation. He, again, giving some final instructions to the workers. They have succeeded in capping the lower left-hand corner of your picture. You can see a pile of gravel. That was a pylon going down into the shaft, and now it is completely filled with gravel and sandbags. The other shaft beginning perhaps as soon as tomorrow or even on Sunday. That will be filled with concrete and then all the plugs will be there. And as Larry Metty said early on, then everyone will keep their fingers crossed to make sure that it holds. That's a Friday night update as this holiday weekend begins. Bill, Linda? Thank you, Jay. And we hope that you'll stay with Channel 2 News, News this weekend as we bring you the very latest on this continually changing story. Tomorrow, the company that drove those pilings into the river, the pilings that apparently punctured the underground tunnel, that company is scheduled to hold a news conference. We'll have that story and the latest on the efforts to finally plug the leak, beginning with our regularly scheduled newscast at 6. So uh, we came into this area. The hole right now, and it may very well be dynamic, meaning it's moving, is located right in this area. It is oval in shape. In real life, it's about this big. It extends down vertically uh, 21.38 feet, if that helps you, from the surface. Uh, then it blends out. Then, then it becomes difficult to detect. Uh, once we let the computer chew up all that uh, tape, we might have a little clearer idea. But it gives us an idea of, of what we can expect. And this data then will be used by hydraulic engineers, the structures people, and the geotechnical people to make further determinations. Um, as far as the other uh, work that we did yesterday, uh, the shaft alignment, uh, we have the, the road level that uh, you've all seen. And uh, you have the, uh, the liner. And just to shorten up the drawing, comes down. And what we, what we discovered there was a, you have an arch shape tunnel and what we were trying to determine is the location of this. What we want to make sure is that when these shafts come down they line up. Um, indeed they all did. Sir, can I ask you, uh, that's, that, that's very technical, can I ask you to explain in, in layman's terms what that means so that someone watching right now on live television can understand what your sonar imager has actually found under that water. Is it dangerous? Is it safe? Does the plan seem to be working? Uh, at this point, uh, in, in my estimation, uh, all of the information we found indicates that that hole is a safe hole. And the plan seems to be working at this point? I would say, and I, I, would, uh, I think that the, the crucial part is all the information that Mr. Kinney's just given you. Uh, they're making progress. Uh, we are simply a part of that. We're kind of an eyes and ears. So the flow of water there is, is now reduced to the point where you feel this thing's going to work? We have not taken any flow ratings today but I haven't seen any surface indications. And there's going to be more of a determination. The hole is a symptom. The real, the real information is exactly what Mr. Kinney's reported to you. Mr. Hibbert, going back to the hole, the original size of the hole was not that that you have drawn on the blackboard. That is after there have been many sandbags. Is that correct? That That's is correct. That's the hole that we're dealing with right now. That is How big was the original hole? Any idea? We really don't have any way to detect that with the kind of sensors we're running. It can be mapped. It would be very difficult with all the debris that was put in. We keep hearing the size of a car. No idea if that's correct. I really don't have any idea. How much does a machine like that cost and how much is the city paying to rid it? I don't know the, the, uh, uh, the contractual obligations in total with the city. I can tell you the value of the machinery. The basic machine prior to the installation of the camera and the sonar is about $60,000.
the camera, the particular camera is a broadcast camera. It's about $20,000. The sonar head, uh, the whole sonar system is about $40,000. Uh, the truck that's out there with all the gear is about 250000 with all the support equipment. There's a tremendous amount of post-processing and a number of computers to run it all. Can I ask Fire Commissioner Orozco a question? Fire Commissioner, we did not get a chance to question you uh, when you made your statement. Could you just uh, explain why you asked some building owners to reduce or cease pumping overnight? Because we wanted to eliminate the draw on the Canal Street tunnel. Uh, and Kenny Construction reported to us, as you know, they filled the case on up full of racks. And they filled them up and it was stable for approximately 15 minutes. Right. Well, I mean, um, with, there was uh, stability in the racks. Then the racks started to draw down. That's when Mr. Kenny said, we've got a possible draw in the tunnel by the water creating a, vacu a vacuum by the pumps that are working throughout the network. So there was never slippage on the east bank, or was there? On the east bank, no. The only the, slippage, the slippage we had occurred over is on, on, the the west bank. On, on the west side in the Canal Street caisson. And the restricted pumping will last for how long? Until we've got the plugs in. Mr. Kenny, could you explain what was happening to that temporary dam? Again. It's just a differential on head. <clears throat> we got we you know we want a static condition which is level, and what we were getting is a drawdown on one side, and the head differential. So we have more weight on this side, less weight on this side, and obviously the more will take the less and shove it away. That's, I mean that's simple terms. A quick question to Carol and Schoenberger: How many incidents has have there been reports of alleged flood repair fraud? Right now we're investigating about five reports dealing with just one or two companies. But we are trying very much to warn people up front. This is the time to be careful. I know everyone is putting their effort into getting the water pumped out. But you also have to, particularly now, you have to be careful. So we are looking into it. And of course, we're not talking about 15 or $20. We're talking about a lot of money. Have some of these ripoff artists been uh, arrested? Is it po are, are there criminal uh, charges possible? Anything is possible. Right now, we're trying to just stop it. We, the investigators were out with members of the sewer department yesterday, talking to people, letting them know they're being monitored. My staff is out again today, and we will continue to look at the situation, and whatever happens, we'll take it from there. Right now, we would prefer to keep everyone pumping and in operation. But if anyone plays around, then they'll, take, they'll get what's coming to them. Commissioner, could you limited pumping. Can I ask Fire Commissioner Roscoe to explain that right now? If someone, if some, if a building owner or or a business owner is sitting at home watching this, perhaps sipping a cup of coffee, wondering if he should be or or she should go downtown and shut the pumps off, what's the story? Most of the, in fact, all of the sites that are doing some type of pumping have either a building engineer or a representative on site. As indicated, we had personal contact with him, and we're allowing him to maintain a level of pumping, okay? Not to, ex not to draw down, that's the bottom line. That's the phrase that they use. Don't draw down. If you're at six feet, maintain your pump level at this feet. So are we saying pump? Yeah, but limited pumping and controlled pumping. When will the plug be in place? Is tonight possible? Anything is possible, but I don't think anybody's in a position to give you an exact time, okay? We're, everybody's working as diligently as, as they can. There is no effort that is not being exerted here, okay? Mr. Kenny, you had said that tonight was possible, or perhaps uh, Easter. I, I agree with the Commissioner. Anything's possible, and, and you know, we, we would like to do it as quick as possible, but we're going to take our time, and, and again, we have to take a look at our safety record. It's still intact. There still is, to my knowledge, no medical injuries, first aid at all, um, and that's what we're going to try and continue to do. So the problem right now remains the Canal Street shaft. You mentioned earlier... It's not, it's not a problem right now as long as everybody maintains the water levels that we're at because we're right now in the process of cleaning, and, you know, if they give us... The rest all of right, today that is the word here from the command center being run by the city of Chicago. That uh, gentleman speaking behind me is John Kenny, uh, the man who's actually in charge of trying to plug this leak. The bottom line, uh, the plug on the east bank of the Chicago River has been holding. No problem over there. The problem of slippage took place in the provisional dam that was in place on the west bank of the Chicago River underneath Canal Street. There was some slippage overnight. They have uh, the, the people here in charge 
charge, went around, spoke to the people in charge of pumping out those flooded basements all through the loop, asked them, reduce the pumping, don't try to draw the water level down, keep it at the same level you're at right now. The problem cleared up. No more slippage. The plan moves forward. Possibly tonight we might see this leak plugged. That is the word from the command center. I am Mike Flannery, reporting live. We once again apologize for interrupting children's programming. We now return you to our regular Saturday morning program. This has been a special report from the Channel 2 Newsroom. We now return to our regularly scheduled program. No way! What remains is proving difficult to drain. At Canal and Jackson tonight, a new pumping station is set to go into action. Within hours, workers hope to tap into floodwaters in the city's deepest tunnels. Here is the latest tonight. New pumping stations will go online to drain those deep tunnels. All five lanes in flood-damaged Hubbard's Cave are open and ready for rush hour tomorrow. And an exclusive Channel 2 poll shows most Chicagoans think Mayor Daley performed well during this flood crisis. We begin our coverage with Larry Menti, who is live at a CTAL stop in the Loop, one of the few places that is still shut down from the flood. Larry? We're at Chicago and Franklin, and CTA riders who are used to taking the subway into the Loop, for those riders, while the city must seem like it's moved further down the track, it's just that much more difficult to get to work these days, taking much, much longer for those riders. We are at the Chicago and Franklin stop, as I mentioned, and these tracks are usually reserved for the Ravenswood line. However, during the flood cleanup, subway lines that usually run under State Street have been detoured up here. The good news for those riders, however, is that come next week, they can go underground again. It may be only a puddle compared to last week's flood, but there is still enough water under the loop tonight to stop a train. Still, the CTA says tomorrow it will test some unmanned trains on the damp tracks. If all goes well, the State Street line will be running again next Monday. The Dearborn line, next Wednesday. But the train lines will only run again if these lines keep pumping floodwaters out from under the loop at a rate of at least an inch an hour. The Army Corps of Engineers has told the CTA, no problem. Well, I think it's realistic if what we're hearing it holds, and that is this one inch an hour to two inch an hour, uh, because we, we won't run until the water is below our track level. CTA crews are working around the clock to get everything ready for tomorrow's test run. The flood has cost the CTA well over a million dollars in lost revenues and has cost its riders millions of hours in lost time. Uh, it would take me basically maybe about 45 minutes to an hour to get to work. Now? Two hours and a half. For thousands, the subways through the loop are the only way to get back and forth to work. And speeding underground has been replaced by waiting for shuttle buses above ground. For them, next week can't come fast enough. A week from Monday. It's going to take that long? No sooner? A week from Monday. That's the soonest. That's terrible. So the CTA subways that run through the loop should be back to normal next week. More good news for commuters. The Kennedy at Hubbard should be back to normal tomorrow for the Monday rush as the city slowly gets back to normal after the great Chicago flood. Reporting from Chicago and Franklin, Larry Menti, Channel 2 News. Larry, thanks very much. Tonight, Mayor Daley is getting high marks from Chicagoans for his handling of the great Chicago flood. An exclusive Channel 2 News poll indicates most registered voters rate the mayor's performance during the crisis from good to excellent. But the results aren't all encouraging for the mayor, who himself expressed fears about the flood creating a lack of confidence in city government. Channel 2's Lester Holt is here with the results. Lester? Jay, the flood swamped careers and perhaps political futures as well as downtown basements. The exclusive Channel 2 News poll, commissioned in conjunction with WBBM News Radio and the Southtown Economist, finds Chicagoans pointing fingers of blame, but not necessarily the same place as the mayor is pointing them. The registered voters we surveyed are also nervous about who's going to pay for the mess and skeptical about the answers they're getting. Nine days after the flood began, the city was out with its official explanation. A construction company doesn't do its homework. City workers overseeing the project dropped the ball. But was there more to it we haven't been told? Half of those we polled tell us they agree with the assertion that a cover-up about the tunnel problem is underway. That the city is not telling the whole truth. 
The City Hall guillotine was working overtime last week as heads rolled over the accident, including City Transportation Chief John LaPlante. When we ask voters whom they thought was to blame for the accident, 37% agree with the mayor that city inspectors are to blame. 14% told us the contractors are at fault. Despite the fact John LaPlante was the first to be punished, only 5% pin the blame on him. 19% blame no one, chalking the crisis up as just an accident. A quarter of those we surveyed simply don't know or refuse to say. The accident has opened a lot of eyes about the state of Chicago's infrastructure. Asked if Mayor Daley's staff should have known more about problems with our streets, bridges and tunnels, a whopping 75% agree they should have. 19% disagree. Respondents to our poll generally give high marks to those in charge of fixing the leak and cleaning up the mess, including the CTA, ComEd, and Kenny Construction. And the mayor is no exception. 47% would rate the mayor's response to the flood as very good or excellent. 23% grading his handling of the crisis as good. Only 9% said the mayor has done a fair job. And 15% would grade his performance as poor. While voters are pleased with a disaster response, they are hardly pleased with the price tag and what it may mean to them. Willing to pay more state or local taxes to pay for flood repairs? Only 22% agree. Nearly three quarters of those we surveyed disagree. The poll, however, found a significant number willing to reach into their pockets to upgrade the city's aging infrastructure as a whole, though the majority are still against that too. To what extent the flood may have affected Mayor Daley's political future is unclear. But as he begins the second half of his term, the long honeymoon he enjoyed appears to be over. Slightly more than half of those in our survey voted for Daly last time around. But when we ask them if Daly has performed well enough to deserve re-election, or whether another person should be given a chance, 46% tell us Daly should be re-elected. But a quite significant 40% say it's time for a new person to have a shot at the job. Still, 60% give the mayor a good approval rating so far. The exclusive Channel 2 News poll, commissioned in conjunction with WBBM Radio and the Southtown Economist, involved telephone surveys of 400 registered Chicago voters. The margin of error is plus or minus 4.8 percentage points. Tomorrow night, we'll have more from our poll, including what Chicagoans are saying about casino gambling here. And what they are saying, politicians will certainly want to hear. Elizabeth? All right, thank you, Lester. In other news tonight, Northern California is rocked with aftershocks. Thousands of tremors are rattling a wide region of the state since yesterday's major quake, which registered 6.9 on the Richter scale. Most of Main Street in Scotia, California, burned to the ground when the earth shifted again just after midnight. The quake set off a fire that spread from one store to the next. We're all pretty shell-shocked right now. You can see there's people all over the streets. I don't want to go home. This is our, my second quake within 12 hours, and we're all, I'm pretty jittery right now. 